Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Kyla Schuler to discuss The Trouble with White Women, a counter history of feminism published by Bold Type Books. Kyla Schuler is Associate Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and Faculty Director of the Women's Global Health Leadership Certificate Program at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She's the author of Biopolitics of Feeling, Race, Sex, and Science in the 19th Century, and her writing has appeared in The Rumpus, Los Angeles Review of Books, and Post Road. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Jules Gill Peterson, the author of Histories of the Transgender Child, the first book to shatter the widespread myth that transgender children are a brand new generation in the 21st century. Jules is Associate Professor of English and Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And please order your copy of The Trouble with White Women from Books and Books Below. Thank you for supporting independent bookstores. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome. Hi everyone. Hello. Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you, um, thank you everyone for, for being here. And thank you so much, Kyla, for, um, for inviting me to be in conversation with you tonight. I just want to reiterate that call to everyone. Like, this is a beautiful, gorgeous book. Um, and, you know, I feel like it's a really delightful object, perfect for the holiday season. And dare I say, a great book to buy the white women in your life, potentially, <laughs> but not just the white women. <laughs> I will say, as uh, I really related to the foreword by Brittany Cooper, you know, talking about reading this, well, she was talking about reading it as, as a Black feminist, and for me, reading it as a brown woman and a woman of color feminist, um, just really, yeah, I feel such a sense of gratitude for this book that, um, yeah, I kind of wanted to say it's like, it does a couple things that are really rare. And then I, I promise I have some questions that I, but I just can't help but soapbox for a moment. You know, I mean, Kylie, you and I are both, are both scholars by training and have written, you know, traditional kind of academic monographs, um, which are their own peculiar beast. Um, but there's something really moving to me about a book that is both really comprehensive and deep and, and well-researched, I mean, like it has all the receipts that you could ever need, but it's also really incredibly narratively engaging. It's just like actually a page turner, I have to say, I've just was like devouring it um, over the past uh, week or so. And um, it's also a book that I think on the one hand, we feel truly now more than ever, like we need this book, like that, that will be something I wanna talk about tonight. Like right now, right this moment, I mean, the trouble with white women might as well be the subtitle to almost every headline in the news. Um, but it's also a book that feels like it's centuries in the making. And it's in the sense that it's about something that's been centuries in the making. Um, and so I just really wanted to, to offer that as a kind of uh, framing meditation and, and a kind of gratitude um, for, for something that, you know, I think is really, really hard to pull off. And as a writer and a historian and a fellow traveler, um, I'm just really grateful for that. So thank you so much for it, Kyla. Thank you, Jules. Um, well, maybe maybe we could actually start there. And, and so I guess the way we were sort of thinking of proceeding tonight is that Kyle and I will talk for a bit, um, but please, as we're talking, feel free to, to throw some questions down um, in the bottom of the screen and they'll be banked there and then I can um, relate them and then we can, we can go from there. Um, but I thought maybe for folks um, who are tuning in who haven't had a chance to, to read the book yet, 
You know, I wonder, I think one of the really interesting things that this book does is it does make this like very reasoned historical argument, right? It is not just a sort of splashy title. And actually we've seen all these kinds of puff pieces and sort of journalistic or, or even let's be honest, like social media hot takes about white women, right? But you actually take time to label and describe something called white feminism that you argue is a sort of remarkably stable, I think is the phrase that you use, formation, and actually trace it from the 19th century all the way you know, to the present day. And so I kind of wanted to start there and ask you maybe to share with us, like, how do you define that sort of entity that's sort of stable enough and yet remarkably flexible, right? Mm -hmm. And that's able to change and almost like, camouflage itself, like it's such a chameleon. Um, and I think that speaks to why it's been so persistent, but like, what is this thing, white feminism, if this isn't just sort of a, oh, white women are causing, you know, trouble again, but this is actually like a real thing in the world. So yeah, I wonder if you could kind of share with us that kind of sneak peek into what the book talks about. Yeah, um, well, you know, like you, like a historically minded researcher who spends a, you know, a fair amount of time in archives and also just really wants our hands in the raw sources from the time period mm -hmm. we're talking about before I feel comfortable saying what anything is, right? Mm -hmm. And I was really captivated by this term, white feminism, that has become so popular in the last five or so years because mm -hmm. it is relatively brand new. You know, it was, it was a term used by some indigenous feminists and Chicana feminists in the 1980s, but it didn't really take off as a descriptor. Um, mm -hmm. But now we see it everywhere and it is, it is so useful as a way to describe a kind of feminism that prioritizes white women. But that also didn't quite go far enough. I wanted to understand well, what is it really, right? Um, and I suspected that the typical problem with white feminism that we often discuss, which is that it ignores women of color, that that doesn't actually go far enough in capturing its harm, right? Because most forms of oppressive power structures um, don't do their, don't amass power by ignoring others. They amass power by taking it from others. And what I found is that White feminism, the problem with it is not that it works through a sin of omission. It's not that it ignores poor women, black women, indigenous women, other women of color, trans women. It's that it actually uses more marginalized people as raw fuel to drive their own success. And I felt that that method of white feminism really stretch true across the period from the beginnings of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony developing the approach in the 1840s and 1850s and on all the way up to the present. Um, so that's the method, like actually using others as fuel, almost like in a vampiric way to drive mm -hmm. your own success um, with the overall um, theory um, of that when a woman is, um, when a white woman especially, or maybe to some degree a woman is in charge of the power structure, she will redeem that power structure. Mm. Right? When we have a feminist CEO, according to somebody like Sheryl Sandberg, then we have a equal system. And I found that that, you know, sanctifying, even salvific force of white feminism had not been fully appreciated and also is where it's true harm lies because the goal is to try to get to the top of existing power structures with the fantasy that once one is in charge that that structure is redeemed right like Kirsten Gillibrand's famous joke of if it were Lehman sisters and not Lehman brothers we wouldn't have had the 2008 financial collapse and that's how white feminism ends up leaning in to racism to to homophobia to transphobia um to climate injustice capitalism, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, I mean, thank you for that really um, bracing account. And it's it's really remarkable, right? How this sort of maybe recent kind of cultural and especially, I don't wanna say pop cultural, but a kind of public kind of very online interest in um, naming something as white feminism is actually 
this sort of invitation to go much deeper and trace like, well, where did that actually come from? And what are its, you know, constituents? And I just, I really love this intervention to say that, you know, contrary to that sort of, I, I just wrapped up teaching intro to, to women's studies tonight. So, you know, for anyone who's taken a class like that, you often get introduced to this sort of wave theory of feminism. Oh, there was the first wave. Those are the suffragettes. And yes, they, they were white women. So, you know, they didn't, they didn't think about anyone else, right? And then second wave, well, they, they were also white women, actually, and also kind of didn't really think about anyone else. But then finally, you know, sometime in, who knows, the 1980s, the 1990s, we got to the third wave, and, and now things are finally starting to change. And that that narrative itself is so patently untrue. It was one invented, right? One invented and reflective of the investments of certain white feminists who wanted to cement kind of like after the fact that salvific, you know, kind yeah. of narrative by proving that, ah, oh, by the 80s and the 90s, white women finally realized their mistakes. When in fact, part of what you're showing here, and this leads me to my next question, is that white feminism isn't just this sort of island right that formed on its own and had no regard for any other groups you know particularly in the united states on the contrary white feminism is constantly defined through its attempt to extract value particularly out of um african americans and indigenous people right but um but also you know is constantly engaged in sort of battles around racial supremacy and racial governance right so but one of the things that i think is really important about this book and and that you know i, I really want to underline is that we get this sort of important history of white feminism that we haven't seen before but you do something really smart which is that you pair it all the way along with what you call you know this counter history of another kind of feminism which we you know today tend to call intersectional feminism drawing on the the work of black uh, feminist legal scholar kimberly crenshaw right but that you really chart this again like two centuries long history of intersectional feminism and what's so interesting to me right is that there we actually see the roots of this alternative feminist movement that you know where black women are at the center, but also indigenous women, right? This whole cast of characters, trans masculine people, trans women, uh, you know, immigrants, working class people, right? That you, you sort of are able to both treat this kind of dominant class, the white women, but you also actually, you know, show the cards of all the others who are working against them. Um, but in a way that I think is really complex, I, I have more to ask about that, but but maybe first, like, could you could you give a sense of like, yeah, how you treat this sort of long lineage of intersectional feminism and maybe how you see it contrasting with um, white feminism? Because I think it's a really innovative formulation that, you know, I think people are like even historians are not necessarily familiar with or don't come and think that way. Like that we're aware of these historical figures that you talk about, say from the 19th century. Right, um, but don't necessarily apply that label, intersectional feminist. So, could you talk us through? Yeah, that? yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, this what, what this that structure of each mm -hmm. chapter having an icon, white woman feminist like oh, this is Kitty Stanton, Margaret Sanger, Betty Friedan, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, but contrasted you know, with, within each chapter with another person in that same movement, whether it's birth control or civil rights or abolition, who approached the same topic, but from a, what we would call, now call an intersectional approach that understood sexism, racism, capitalism, empire to all be intertwined struggles. Um, you know, it, it made it so fun to be able to show mm -hmm. and to really to discover for myself too, how beat by beat, every time there was so someone saying, no, I'm fighting only for the white women. The goal is to have white women saviors in charge of everything. But they weren't, it wasn't that they weren't aware of other approaches, right? They weren't, they weren't ignorant of them. They weren't, um, the, uh, that, that anti-racist feminism hadn't yet been invented in the 1890s. It was that the white woman actually literally stamped out the other approaches, but at the same time, drained the activists of their energy and their ideas and some of, the, of their vibrancy. 
And it was really shocking to me actually about how literal that was mm. moment by moment, right? So for example, in a chapter on Harriet Beecher Stowe and, and Harriet Jacobs, Harriet Jacobs you know, famously wrote the first narrative written by a black woman in the US, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. It is a tremendous text. I teach it as often as I can. Um, and she wrote it in part because she had first approached Harriet Beecher Stowe to write it on her behalf because as a, as a formerly enslaved person, she didn't feel confident writing her own story. And Harriet Beecher Stowe said, thank you for your really dramatic and vulnerable life story. I'm gonna use it in my next book. And Harriet Jacobs was so shocked and upset that the, the Harriet Beecher Stowe, famous abolitionist, was trying to steal her story that she ended up writing it just to have ownership over it herself. Um, that, like those kind of details of like moment by moment, even that some of our our great breakthroughs um, in in uh, women's culture and feminism have have happened from women of color pushing back against white women trying to take their material. Um, it mm -hmm. made the, the, it gave it gives the 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 book a, you know also kind of narrative tension, um, which I really wanted because I wanted to write something that is fun to, to read. Mm. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person who does historical work, but who all my degrees are on literature because I love reading novels. <laughs> and my goal in this book as a narrator was honestly just to disappear. I was mm. like, there are these incredible stories from the, from the past and these women themselves said it better than I ever could. Like, how can I bring them to the page and let mm -hmm. the reader for themselves like feel this drama and the tension and the theft and the stakes um, and not have the history of anti-racist feminism be an abstract political concept, but a living, breathing ideology that people really had to fight for their lives in order to develop. Yeah, and so also we have now, right? Like I, there's a lot of hammering yeah. I think, in social media of like, well, okay, we know that white feminism is bad, but what do we do now? Like right. where do we turn for feminism? And almost like we need to reinvent the wheel, but we mm. do not. Mm. Black women especially have been laying out an agenda of what an anti-racist, anti-capitalist, pro-earth feminism looks like, and we just haven't been paying attention. Yeah, I think that's such an important point and so well said. I mean, it's it's really interesting because I think people might come to a book like this with this sort of expectation. Ah, okay, I, I know I know how it's gonna shape up, right? The white women are, you know, bad, ap bad actors, right? And then the black women and the women of color and the trans women and the trans masculine people, those are all gonna be our kind of heroes. And, oh, you know, Kyla Schuler is just putting them together and, and kind of watching them duke it out. But in fact, that's not the case. There are these incredible actual ties between the people in each chapter. And, and I think that was one of the things that really kind of gripped me in as a reader. And I certainly learned, I mean, I learned, you know, something about all of the people in the book, even though I, you know, am familiar with all of them as a historian. But I mean, it was really, there are just these really prescient moments too, right? Like, was it, was it in fact Betty Friedan herself um, who tried to like basically steal the concept of Jane Crow uh, and like use it for her next book title from Polly Murray. And I like, I, I truly gasped when I was reading. I was like, no, she did not. Like these actual moments, like we're not talking about um, white women, white feminism um, as, you know, thieving or stealing from, you know, uh, black folks or people of color or trans people as a metaphor. It's literal. It's literal. <laughs> Well, like, it, it, it honestly yeah. stunned me. I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't believe how well the concept of the book works. To be honest, it's <laughs> a know? little, it's a little disturbing, right? But it, but it, but it goes I'll, to to prove the point. Yeah, I'll never be able to repeat it. I don't think in a future book, but where <laughs> you know, where like the structure of the book enacts the argument. Um, yeah, which was really satisfying as a writer that mm. I didn't have to keep saying I'm arguing these the white feminism was stealing. And and draining force from the more marginalized, it, you know, the material just does does that work. Um, yeah, that's, and that's I think there's working. there's a kind of honoring of a sentiment that I think, you know, people who have been who have experienced that 
you know, theft, right? Like I'm thinking of, you know, the black trans women and trans women of color in circles that I run in. And it's like, it's like we know in our bones that that theft happens. Sometimes we experience it very literally, right? From doctors or experts, people come and take what we know and repackage it. But, but it's also this sort of intergenerational knowledge that's transmitted in it. And it shows up, like it shows up. And, but you, we don't always have, it's like one of those forms of, um, minoritarian knowledge it's like it's a form of truth but it doesn't always have the kind of evidence that would hold up say like you know in the public sphere and so it's really i think very moving to to now have this text that actually really lays out those exact moments you know like here's it's like and and i think there just to go back to what you said too about that kind of you know, I don't want to over inflate the idea that social media is the only world, but but maybe after this long, you know, in a pandemic, it's starting to just feel that way. But I think I see that frustration every day, you know, on Twitter in particular, um, especially, you know, in this generation of young folks who have come of age, you know, in a real kind of critical consciousness that the grand narrative sold to them um, about, you know, American liberal democracy and capitalism are just like complete lies and bullshit um, and serve, you know, the interests of a ruling class. And like, they feel that too in their bones, but, you know, either because their states are literally outlawing discussion of the history of the United States or what have you, right? Or even for reasons less nefarious, they're sort of, you know, kind of hitting that brick wall. And I see this a lot in my students when they arrive in college too, this feeling like, well, everything up to now has been insufficient because look how bad the world is today. So the task must be as gargantuan as reinventing the whole world. And I think it's really powerful to say that actually, instead of understanding that history has just been a record of these you know, sort of hegemonic white women, there's this complete other archive of people who weren't just showing you an alternative they were also fighting <laughs> they were challenging those white women on their terms yeah. right from the very beginning um but i guess i kind of wanted to ask this is sort of a pet question of mine to some extent but you know i was really moved because i think it's it's easy then to fall into a kind of like you know uh, good women bad women good guys bad guys kind of model here right where it's like well, we, you know, we come into this book probably feeling a little critical about, about white feminism, right? And so we're like rooting for obviously these black women or, you know, or for Polly Murray or for Zik Kalasa, you know, for, um, for AOC, right? And we're feeling like, yes, like go, you know, fight. But I, I think one thing I was particularly impressed by and kind of moved by is that I don't think you over idealize any of the, these resistive actors, these intersectional feminists. And one of the things that I appreciated, you know, especially, you know, in the earlier time periods, let's say in the 19th century, you know, someone like um, Zit Kalasar or even Harriet Jacobs, you know, people, um, black women or, or indigenous women um, who were still kind of engaged in a sort of politics of respectability or mm -hmm. racial uplift, right? And that actually had some, some interesting strategic kind of, shall we say, dalliances with things that otherwise we think of as pretty bad, you know, like eugenics <laughs> or um, state systems of boarding schools that are, you know, ripping indigenous children out of their family units. And there's this sort of careful attention that you pay to the actual kind of historical um, archive and, and to the, the projects that these people were engaged in. And so you're sort of not trying to suggest that they're doing necessarily what we would do today. But I really appreciate your refusal to romanticize the resistance to white feminists and, and this kind of refusal to romanticize intersectional feminism, precisely because you argue, I think you're quite right, that that's what a lot of white feminists do today, right? Well, they call on Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, they call on black women like Stacey Abrams, and they think by calling on them and invoking them, that they are, again, sanctifying their politics. And so I think it's really interesting as a historian yeah. to use that. But could you could you talk about that and, and was yeah, it? Yeah, it wasn't so easy, us? you know, because I, I definitely like had a, temp a temptation at first hmm. to, to have a more black and white narrative. And part of that also hmm. is because I, you know, I loved writing this book because I got to write narrative. You know, I wasn't writing academic 
language where I was like, oh, well, how would point A mm. logically turn into point B? <laughs> Instead, I got to ask, where's the story here? Where's the momentum? Where's the tension? And where is that taking me? Um, but that kind of story format as a goal does really draw itself to um, to start to start characters. Um, you know, in a in a rudimentary form. Obviously, great storytellers do not do that. Um, but you know, I had so I had to just really make um, make a political decision. You know that um, that purity politics are not going to get us anywhere. Mm. Right. I had to even do things like pay attention to my own mistakes on a day to day level mm. and remember that for social movements to work, we actually have to move from positions of generosity, generosity toward ourselves, especially right. Like forgiving ourselves for our, mis our mistakes, having an orientation to ourselves and our comrades. where We say, yeah, we know we can do better instead of a harsh judgment that just shuts people down and makes people be like, well, I don't want to be part of your judgy, blamey movement anyway, right? Like for a social movement to be effective, it needs to grow outward and invite people in and meet people where they're at. So I found myself really drawn to understand, to wanting to, to look at that tension and conflict within each of these figures, right? And to understand that even, even just spe spectacular people would now Call, you know, now coming to be known as heroes like Polly Murray um, made all kinds of decisions that even 10 years later were really old fashioned, right? She hated the word black, right? She only wanted to be referred to as, as Negro. She thought that that was the proper political term and that black, like rallying around black was actually going backwards, right? She totally buried her queer history and also her, her trans um, identity. Um, but that doesn't mean that therefore like this that that Polly Murray is a problem is a is a figure that didn't like begin a kind of feminism that is really useful for us. And by the same token, I was also really drawn to all the white women, um, with one mm. exception. <laughs> and I bet you can guess who that is. Um, is it is it, is it, is it Cheryl Sandberg? <laughs> no, actually, no, actually, oh. no. Like I found I found Lean In actually really charming. And like really? that's, that's part of her magic is that she is able to be or has a, a piece of approachable. Like that's part mm -hmm. of her approach. That's you know um, of seeming like the girl next door, and um, mm. and that's part of her inspiration and also part of how she retains a likability despite being so successful. Right? Because mm. one of her big insights is, if you're a woman, the more successful you are, the more unliked you are. And so she has this kind of white woman genius of realizing if she performs her fallibility, <laughs> then we will then we will like her. And I found myself um, charmed by that in a way I did not expect. Um, you know, but even someone like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, like I just love the story of where she's mm. speaking out on a stage in front of a big audience and she's being um, heckled by some of the audience. And then this this man stands up and he says, you know, what are you talking about that women need to be in the polling place like my wife gave me eight sons are you saying that her life wasn't important and she just like stops and looks him up and down and says i've seen few men in my life worth repeating eight times <laughs> like it is a Ooh. savage cut down <laughs> right? and so that it, you know it's, it's a combination of like it made it hurt more when mm -hmm. these brilliant inspiring women chose a form of feminism that reinforced whiteness um and be because they did have like so much talent and so much drive and were were fighting against really tremendous levels of institutionalized sexism you know all the way until my lifetime in the in the you know late 1970s yeah. um and i think it's i just think it's it's really important for us to remember that we're not looking for un varnished movements or heroes we're looking for tactics and strategies that are heading in the right direction and of coalitions we can form around certain objects and goals and not holding out for the pure movement or the pure leader yeah i think that's such a beautiful message and it's true you know and I, there's something important about this kind of narrative writing where you do find yourself rooting for people you know and i guess 
especially these 19th century figures who are out on the lecture circuit, right? There are so many people who appear in this book. You know, you mentioned it's like, oh yeah, she gave 46 lectures in like five months. And I, you know, I'm sitting here as someone that gives a lot of lectures, like, you know, feeling a migraine coming on, but also being like, ooh, I know what that feels like when you are in the work and you become, you know, aware of your imperfections, but you're also getting bogged down in in movement work, in organizing, right, in politics, and and how messy that can really become. And I think there is something really gripping about about sitting with that. Um, I want to ask another question, but first, I just want to remind folks that you also can contribute your questions at any time. So feel free to go ahead and plunk some in as we're talking here, um, and then I'll be able to turn to them. Um, but I, but I did want to kind of pick up on on where you were going there and and turn our sights on, you know, what's going on today. Um, you know, the trouble with white women, indeed. And you know, there is a chapter in this book for folks who who want some historical perspective and some really helpful thinking, you know, about about um, reproductive politics and about uh, birth control and abortion. A chapter, you know, about uh, Margaret Sanger, um, and. It's, it's, it's one that I think does some really helpful work in talking about how uh, Margaret Sanger's, um, you know, white supremacy or eugenics have been actually also weaponized by anti-abortion activists. And, and so Margaret Sanger being this kind of embattled character, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, because she really has sort of become a character um, and kind of mythologized, but you know, you pair her with Dr. Dorothy um, Farabee in, in, in a way that, you know, really trains our eyes on, you know, what actual kind of work was Planned Parenthood trying and, and failing to do say in the South with working class black, um, working class black women in particular. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, I sort of wanted to, you know, ask sort of what do, what do you see, and maybe it's not just this chapter on, on Margaret Sanger and, and, and Farabee, that's the most obvious place to turn, but do you see sorts of lessons as I think folks are just sort of processing, reeling, angry? I mean, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time seeing, you know, people's reactions for example, you know, during the Supreme Court hearings um, last week, and there's just this kind of cynicism, pessimism, um, despondency, despair, this feeling that like, well, you know, things are rigged and we're going to lose Roe versus Wade. And, you know, it's like, I was seeing these kinds of almost like, there were these historical arguments being made, right? Like, wow, this is what you get, liberals or, or the left, you sat around for 40 or 50 years and let you know the Christian right and the Reagan revolution out-organize you, outspend you, outmaneuver you, or, or this kind of much more clipped historical imagination that's much more about Trumpism and the sort of fantasy that the Supreme Court has only like recently been like this. And you know, maybe the other side of that is this kind of Ruth you know, Bader Ginsburg worship or whatever, but, um, but you know, I, that these kinds of really diametrical narratives that feel like they carry, you were just talking about kind of purity tests. I feel like they embed so much purity around like what good politics are. And, and, and this just, I see a lot of anger directed at white feminism, right? At Amy, Co Amy Coney Barrett, you know, suggesting that pregnancy isn't a big deal because you can just drop a baby off at a fire station, right? It's like, when what gestation is no big deal sure right and um, tell that to anyone who's ever done it but um or who's afraid of you know being forced to to give birth but i'm just sort of curious like you know in this moment where i think i understand that people are really angry and also very scared um and tend to think that we're living through some sort of collapse in this historical moment that's unprecedented or just so bad that we're losing something we had before is there a kind of different perspective is, or are there lessons that you take from this work that you've done in this book that you think could be helpful guides as folks are trying to understand like how to respond, how to organize, how to out-organize the anti-abortion? Yeah, side? yeah, I think I have, I have two responses to that. And one is, you know, this chapter contrasts Margaret Sanger's approach to birth control, which was highly eugenic. You know, it's not eugenic in the way that she's often accused of now. She mm. wasn't a particular racist. She was actually relatively anti-racist for her time period, but she had really terrible disability politics. Right? Mm. For her, 
she wanted, she believed that one quarter of the world's people were unfit to reproduce because of physical or mental disability. Of course, disability accusations of unfitness gets overdetermined by race and poverty and immigration status. Um, but on its face, her, um, her belief in the vast inequality of people and that birth control would improve society by preventing the wrong people from giving birth wasn't actually especially a, a racist project, but it was a very single axis focus on an idea that preventing the wrong kind of births could improve society. And then the other half of her agenda, of course, was to give women that she would call fit the opportunity to decide whether or not to give birth, right? So it's voluntary motherhood for the fit and remove um, uh, fertility from the unfit via especially birth control, but also potentially sterilization for her. Um, and that that is a single access goal of what a feminist reproductive agenda looks like. It's a goal that says, we are about preventing births. That's what a um, what that's what a women's liberation project can look like when it comes to reproductive health. But when I was looking in the Planned Parenthood archives and reading the details of her project with Southern Black women, because I really wanted to understand, like, what was this project? Was it Black genocide, like pro-life people can, can uh, accuse her of now? And it was not. And one of the reasons I found this is because she worked with many Black leaders on that project like Dr. Dorothy Farabee. And mm -hmm. Dr. Dorothy Farabee had developed an agenda of birth control and reproductive um, health that we would now call reproductive justice, as was named a term that was coined by Black women activists in the 1990s. And that is a feminist approach to reproduction that has three goals. It says, yes, we need to enable women and people to prevent pregnancy. We also need to be able to to enable other people to have um, ch have children if they want to, but are not able to because of reasons of poverty, especially, you know, or healthcare or imprisonment or what have you. And then also we need to be able to make sure that parents can raise their children in healthy environments, that they have access to the right, to, to, to safe housing, right? To healthy food, to all the elements that are actually required in in have in having um, in raising children, right? It's not just a biological state, but right, the lifelong process, and that's the kind of approach that I think we have been desperately missing on the national level, uh, where feminists, uh, where the dominant movement for for um, reproductive choice has put all the weight on just that piece of preventing pregnancy. Um, and it, it does make us um, vulnerable, um, one, to being tied to a project like Sanger's and also to um, not having the structures when, when people like Amy Cohen Barrett say, but, can't, but don't we have the social structures in place for if you don't want to have a child, then, um, then, uh, you know, then you don't have to raise it yourself. But we know full well as a, as a society we do not have those kinds of structures in place to enable children to live like safe, uh, healthy childhoods. Um, that single axis focus that is characteristic of white feminism, right? Have one goal, which is in the case of birth control, just preventing pregnancy uh, has been a real liability to us. That said, I do not want to ac um, accuse feminism for being why we are possibly losing Roe v. Wade. I think that would be really backward, right? Um, and the right has been tremendously organized. This has been the number one goal for many people since the 1970s. I don't think it's feminist fault that this is coming on, on, the, um, on the chopping block, but I do think that it is an invitation to think long and hard about what a feminist reproductive politics actually looks like. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's a moment to think about coalition too, as a sort of process. And you write really movingly in the conclusion about, you know, intersectional feminism as not just a different perspective, right? It's not just, you know, having better representation or inclusion. It's not just about a diversified feminism. It's not just about 
a feminism that, you know, leads from the bottom or from the people who are, you know, multiply oppressed, you know, through not just gender, but also race, nationality, language, class, and, you know, ability. Um, but it's also, you know, about being able to build political coalition across difference in a way that obviously white feminism doesn't want to do, right? White feminism has a singular definition of, of a relationship across difference, and that's extraction, right? Um, white women will extract value out of uh, people of color, the working classes, queer people, trans people, and will then discard what they don't want, right? Whether they are, you know, nominally pro-inclusive or literally eugenicists or TERFs or what have you, right? And so there, there's something I think um, really important in that lesson, again, too, to, to maybe part of what I hear you say is like, avoid the kind of hand-wringing gesture that's like feminism we failed we lost this single axis version mm -hmm. right of roe v wade so it's our fault so we obviously don't know how to do anything right when a different way of looking at that would be well a reproductive justice politics is expansive enough that you know and and this leads me maybe to the last area i wanted to talk about as it intersects with some of my work you know we've seen also this year um, you know, an unprecedented wave, and you mentioned this in the book, of anti-trans legislation more than has ever, ever, uh, anti-LGBT legislation more than has ever been proposed and passed in, in U.S. history, right? And a lot of that is focused on trans youth, on trans girls and women um, in sports, and including banning, you know, pediatric uh, gender-affirming care. And, you know, one of the things I've been saying as a historian of trans, you know, trans people, but also as someone who's been speaking in the media, I've been like, look at what these GOP controlled legislators are interested in. What are their priorities, right? And it's very consistent, anti-abortion, anti-trans, and res anti-black restrictions on voting rights. And it's like, well, now the problem with the single access framework there, right, is that it doesn't understand the relationship between those three things. Well, if they're all going together, then it suggests to me that our politics has to be as big as that, right? Our coalition has to be as big as that or bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we're not trained to think that way. We're not trained to feel comfortable that way. This whole history of white feminism is pushing back, right? You know, this all of these ways that um, the counter history was thrown out or was you know, not thrown out, but was certainly um, repressed and kind of hidden from view, not taught in school and whatnot, right? Um, and so it really does seem like, I think you're giving us a lot of um, opportunity to rethink like, what are the actual pieces of coalition? Like who are the, who are the groups? Who are yeah, the- Yeah, and what's feminism? You know, because it's really, yeah. it's, it's a, a, a little shocking, another little shocking thing. When I really think about, Okay, well, that typical definition of a feminist is someone who mm -hmm. believes in the quality of the sexes. Like that already is white feminism, right? That's already deciding there is a central goal, there's a primary axis of oppression, and that is around sex and sexism. Mm -hmm. And it's allowing every other battle to have secondary set status, right? Be relegated to a supporting role that you may or may not tap into. <laughs> Uh, but you're quite right to say, to point out that it's completely ill-equipped for where we're, what we're facing now, um, which is this interlocking position of, of trans rights, um, of reproductive rights, and, and Black voting rights, right? Um, yeah. And that's one reason why I really wanted to include a chapter on trans feminism mm -hmm. in this book, because one, because I think trans feminists like Sandy Stone have actually given us some of our most useful ways of understanding gender itself as a concept, right? Some of our best theorists of gender, as you know well from your research, are not from feminism per se, but from from trans theorists and trans feminism, yet, are, yet still most often trans figures and activists, it's like, okay, well, yeah, they can be part of queer theory, but not feminism, when the work is essentially about how we understand that um, gender itself is like a medical scientific uh, you know, construct and invention of the, of the 20th century. Um, that I found uh, really Im important to me um, to, to make it, to show the importance of trans feminism to a feminism at large. Um, but then also, you know, the, the anti-trans feminist 
the anti-trans position is just another iteration of white feminism, right? It says that there is only, there's one way to be a woman. There's one common women's history. There's a common experience that women have. And it, and a trans woman couldn't possibly have that. But neither could Harriet Jacobs, neither could AOC, neither could Zakala Shah, like women of color have been saying forever that there is no universal experience of girlhood, especially when you factor in race and class. Yeah, it's so well put. I mean, I think that the chapter, you know, on on trans feminism in this book is electrifying. I mean, it, it's it's so welcome and and really sorely needed um, and beautifully argued. And I, I I wanted to read one part um, that you know you were just sort of telegraphing for us. But I, I just I, I love the way that um, the way that you talk about how trans exclusionary feminism, so called TERFs, or you know sometimes now they like to go by the hilarious phrase gender critical. You know how they how they really think about the world, right? And and part of why I want to dwell on this moment is I, I often see folks with great intention, right? Fire back, well, they're not feminists. That's not feminism. And you know, which again, as as a trans woman of color, I've always been like, yes, it is. This is feminism, okay? This is white feminism. And actually saying that it's not feminism is not holding it accountable. But but here's a really just beautiful, succinct explanation. Um, this from from your chapter. So, um, a biological binary motors the turf universe. Men are always the oppressor and women always the oppressed. Trans exclusionist feminists adhere to a single axis model of power in which sexism is the basic underlying most fundamental social inequality. Capitalism and colonialism and the racism that fuels their engines lay relatively inert. Instead, maleness or femaleness alone pins one place in the social hierarchy and determines individual behavior. In this simplified cosmos, rape and assault are the primary crimes and women have a common experience of marginalization, assault and abuse at the hands of men. And I think what's so clarifying about that, you know, and I understand this, you know, really intimately and personally too, is there's an incredible rage that builds up for trans, especially for trans women, right? Who these kinds of, you know, you talk about Janice Raymond who really sort of wrote the Bible for this playbook, you know, who's this former nun, right? And it's just like basically is sort of lightly translating a kind of, you know, really intense Christian worldview um, into, into a kind of feminist argument. But, you know, it's being parroted today all over the United Kingdom, all over the United States, really actually across the globe in this kind of global anti-trans network that is very intensely aligned with authoritarian, um, often xenophobic or ethno-nationalist political movements around the world, not just in the US and the UK, but this kind of incendiary, violent strategic rhetoric that casts trans women as ontologically, by virtue of existing, as sexual predators, right? That Janice Raymond really inaugurates this, um, but we start to see this language in the 70s saying that trans women, by existing, yeah. commit rape, right? But not, they could just be sitting alone in their house, right? And they're somehow raping women, right? And, and, and I think one of the things that's so heinous about that, it's not, it's not just that it's it's actually really violent sexualizing speech. It's not just that actually like trans women in particular disproportionately experience sexual violence, right? And we actually, you know, would think that they would be your allies. It's also that it has this kind of, it has this kind of re effect, right? It's like soliciting a reactionary kind of intense response, right? And I, so that's where I think a lot of people's kind of quickness to say, well, they're not feminists. Anyone who sees the world in that lens is not a feminist. And sure, maybe by 2021 standards, someone saying, yes, well, we know men are purely violent creatures who only dream of subjugating women. And women are, you know, very vulnerable, frail creatures who are always in danger of penises is like, yeah, that doesn't really sound very sophisticated, but that actually misses the point, right? And, and I guess I wanted to invite you to elaborate here because I think one of the things that people miss, right, is I think one of the biggest ruses people understandably fall for with gender critical anti-trans turfs, right? Is they fall for the single axis argument. I see it all the time online, right? Mm -hmm. 
people get into these ridiculous rhetorical battles with people who are obviously trolls, but they're using the single axis framework, right? And they frame transness as a crisis in the category of sex, right? Or they reject gender as an idea. They're like, well, gender, that's what trans people have, right? It's all these hilarious, like, sure, sometimes it seems funny, like when people, you know, today I saw on Twitter, it's like all these anti-trans people who are like, you know, pronouns, that's what trans people use. And, you know, of course, people clapping back, like, you know, I need to, you know what pronouns are in a language, right? And I'm like, I know, I know it seems very convenient, but you're conceding to this single axis framework every single time you engage someone on those terms and you can't correct them out of it. There's no rational discussion there. But so I wonder, you know, I think one of the things that you help us see, and I, I've been trying to find better ways to say this too, is like, I think it's, I think it works really well for the United Kingdom and the US to say that gender critical feminism is really classically white feminism. And in the UK, yeah. it's kind of obvious because these do seem to be people, you know, who are like truly invested in the notion of the British empire. That's like, oh, honey, that ended a while ago. And in the US, you know, they are invested in forms of, you know, white political domination of mm. people of color and obviously are not showing up right around you know the threat to reproductive rights or the threat to voting rights because that serves their interests right but but could you tell us a little bit more about what it means to call turfs or gender criticals white feminists because you know i think one obviously it would piss them off so that's great but 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 two i actually think it's really pedagogical for those of us who are in favor of trans rights but struggle you know with this this almost like rhetorical hell that we're living through right yeah like, yeah how do you argue with someone who's making such outrageous claims <laughs> yeah i mean part of it is you know this of uh, identifying this consistency of white feminism across nearly 200 years and finding that the central you know framework right the central theory in white feminism is that sexism is the most significant force of oppression Right? and that the discrimination woman faces is more similar than different. And when I say woman singularly, you know, I, I mean that deliberately also with a capital W, right? And the way that for Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony or Harriet mm -hmm. Beecher Stowe, they're like, we need to talk about woman and they mean this abstract universal woman, which of course always ends up being a, a default um, white woman, right? That, that that claiming that universal claiming the universality that whiteness likes to claim right not mm. being unmarked by any form of of other um and i see that just at work just as much in the in anti-trans feminist position and part of that is because i realize that that they're actually uh, they're actually developing two forms of essentialism mm. right we often talk about their biological essentialism right where they say that sex is real and there's only you know male bodies and female bodies and it's very tidy and <laughs> end of story right and they're, they're claiming that biology is destiny when we know and feminist science studies people have been saying in particular for decades if not you know centuries that bodies are way more complicated than that right uh, on a level of biological diversity and also cultural diversity we live in our bodies far beyond a strict male female binary. So there's that biological essentialism that's pretty obvious when people like JK Rowling say, well, sex is real. And so you are fake as a trans person. But there's also what I call in the book an experience essentialism, mm. which is this idea, this fantasy that there is that common universal experience of woman, the capital, that capital W. And I think for, for me that that is the part that makes the white feminism really clear because, and in the context of the book, you can see how um, throughout like white feminists are fighting for the rights of women and they're fighting to put women at the top of power structures because she will redeem them. Um, but not at looking at what are all the other forces of colonialism or capitalism or, or racism that have put women, um, in charge, right? That have meant that have meant that the only obstacles these people are facing are their gender, and not any other aspects of the um, forces of unequal power. 
um, you know, uh, gaining only ever, ever stronger. I also think it's really interesting, and I think this would be like my, my last uh, my last comment, and then maybe we'll we'll wrap up if there's no questions. Um, is that you know there we have on the one hand people saying, well, these um, these trans uh, these anti-trans people aren't aren't feminists, um, even though they're <laughs> Even though they're they're arguing of, of they're gonna kick trans women out of feminism, but on the other hand, I've been really moved by by my you know friend and colleague Brittany Cooper and what the argument that she's long made um, against saying that um, why it's important for for her you know for black women to hold the term feminism right um, and like she's never been a big fan of womanism because mm -hmm. she said you know, to, to to say you're a womanist but not a feminist because feminism is too white is to buy into this history of white feminism and to participate in the erasure of the counter history. Um, and so, we, you know, there's there's a there's a lot of work to be done for us to unlearn these icons of feminism um, and to be able to tell this more complicated story about. A feminine, an anti-racist, anti-colonial feminism that also, you know, at the end, I really make a make an argument for also how what a spiritual orientation many of the, the intersectional feminists had, right? That they're working for something bigger than themselves, even bigger than politics. <laughs> they're working for living, a, a, you know, developing a, a, a way of life and a way of solidarity and coalition where we can imagine a continued existence on this earth despite capitalist best efforts to bring it to an end as we know it. Um, and I find that just so incredibly inspiring that we actually have a, a vision of a kind of feminism that is about remaking the way we live with ourselves and with our, with our world. That's so beautifully put. And I think it's it's really true. This this is a book like if you are in the struggle, you are in the movements and you are looking for a kind of deep dive that can ground you and help connect you to the people that came before you and struggle, like this is the book for you. But equally, you know, if you are feeling like so many people right now burnt out, <laughs> you know, despondent uncertain of what to do and really kind of worried about, you know, where are we going to move next, you know, as as feminists, like, this really, I think, is an incredible, um, not just companion and narrative, but also um, an opportunity for study, and for critical reflection, and to really end up in just such a beautiful place in the conclusion to this book. Um, yeah, I'm glad you didn't give away too much more because it's really a rewarding read um, to get there. And so I just want to thank you so much, Kyla, for, for sharing. You, oh, it's been such a pleasure. And thank you to, to Books and Books for, for facilitating our conversation tonight. What an amazing conversation. Oh my God. And I love how you wrap that up, Jules. I mean, I, I have nothing to add except we have a lot of work to be done, but the first step is order this book yes. from an independent bookstore. And you can start, you know, learning and having those conversations. But we're so lucky to have had you with us tonight. Thank you so much. On behalf of Books and Books, Miami Book Fair, and to everyone watching, thanks for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.